All right, everybody, we are going to kick off our final session before lunch, and we've got an awesome lunch for you guys. This next session, let's talk about you know, cannabis and wine events, and this is, a, this is something that's come up, comes up all the time when we talk to wineries about you know, what they can do and what they can't do, and, and, uh, and so there's always been a little, you know, I'll say a little bit, but quite a bit of confusion about what you can and can't do. Uh, so we've got an awesome panel up here to talk about that and help educate you. Uh, Carly Warner, who's the co-founder and VP of Marketing for the Garden Society, is going to moderate. And uh, I'm going to ha hand it off to you, Carly, and let you guys take it from here. Thank you so much, and welcome to our panel. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce everyone for you. Uh, on my far left, you have Jamie Evans. She is the founder of The Herb Psalm. Jamie is a cannabis blog and lifestyle brand that focuses on the gourmet side of the industry. She is an educator, host, and writer specializing in cannabis, food, recipes, wine, and the can of culinary world. So please welcome Jamie. Thank you. We have Miss Allison Costa. She is the CEO of, or COO of So Sonoma and CEO of Saka. Uh, she is, uh, sorry, Saka is a cannabis brand uh, of infused beverages. She focuses on health, wellness, as well as um, the deep roots in the wine industry. As an accomplished owner of Costa Brown Winery and co-founder of her own boutique winery brand, Alden Ollie, she is well-versed in both cannabis and wine. So please welcome Allison. Thank you. Next, we have Devika Maskey. She is founder and CEO of the luxury cannabis brand, So Sonoma, in partnership with Allison. Her experience within the regulated alcohol industry, specifically in wine and its viticulture experience and practices, is lending itself to her new role in cannabis. De Devika also recently co-founded the Women's Network Industry Power Women to provide resources to female entrepreneurs in an effort to guarantee success, of which we have enjoyed the fruits of. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please Happy welcome to be Devika. here. Devika. <laughs> And finally, to my immediate left, we have Rebecca Stamey White. She is a legal advocate, advisor, and strategist focusing her practice on the laws related to the sale, distribution, and marketing of alcoholic beverages and medical cannabis. She is a partner at Hinman and Carmichael LLP, a nationally recognized boutique law firm representing uh, these service pro providers. So please welcome Rebecca. Thank you. Now that we've got that taken care of. <laughs> so today we're gonna to be talking about wine and weed events, uh, primarily as they relate to cannabis regulation. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and give each of these lovely ladies a moment to kind of share with you what they do and how that pertains to wine and cannabis. So we'll start with you, Jamie. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Jamie Evans, and as Carly mentioned, I'm the founder of The Herb Psalm. Um, so the Herb Psalm is a cannabis blog and lifestyle brand that really focuses on the gourmet side of the industry. Um, I'm also the founder of Thursday Infused, which is a gourmet event series for the Canicurious down in San Francisco. And having spent over 10 years in the wine industry working for some incredible companies such as Jackson Family Wines and Folio Fine Wine Partners, um, and now running my own business in the cannabis industry, I'm really excited to be here today and to talk about wine and cannabis events. So thank you for joining us in the panel today. Um, I'm Allison Costa, and I come from the wine side of things. Um, with my business partner, Devika Maskey, we have um, Another thing that we didn't really mention was we do So Elevated events series. Um, and this is basically taking the, um, everything that we know from the hospitality side of the industry, from the wine industry, and curating events uh, with wine and cannabis. Um, and then we also have So Sonoma, which is, I'll let Devika yeah, talk about. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Devika, and our brand is called So Sonoma. It's a luxury cannabis lifestyle brand dedicated to reimagining how people approach a health conscious lifestyle. And so we're not just products, we're an experience around the brand, and we're bringing this wine country lifestyle experience of good food, good wine, and now good cannabis to the community through our elevated event series and our products. So Rebecca, um, 
I think we're going to start with you providing a brief overview of what the California state regs currently state in terms of events and uh, winery events, sorry, cannabis events and marketing. So what cannabis can and can't do and also compare that to wine. Great. Um, and just a brief background. I, I do, no, I don't do cannabis events. I wish I did. Um, <laughs> I also wish I did um, wine events, but uh, instead I get to sit in an office and um, advise people on those events and sometimes get to go to them, but very rarely. Um, usually it's on a computer and I get to tell people about the contracts and the sponsorship and um, all that really uh, fun stuff. So much more fun than the events themselves, I promise. Um, so I wanted to start by um, kind of talking a little bit about winery events. Um, a lot of people think uh, they know about alcohol events and um, there's actually a lot more regulations around this activity than um, you may think when you show up to an event. Um, and just a point of comparison, I think it's helpful to kind of see, okay, here's what wineries can do in the state of California, um, and then we'll compare that to what you can do uh, for cannabis events. Um, I think it's important to remember that the wine industry uh, in California has been exist in, in existence since before Prohibition. Um, when Prohibition ended in the 30s, uh, you know, that's a good 80 plus years of laws and regulations that have been put on the books. Um, it has taken a while to get all of these privileges, um, but here's what we've got. Um, and I'm gonna stick just with wineries, the Type 02 license. There's kind of a lot of hybrid licenses within that, um, but for simplification, we'll start with just the winery license. Um, so again, with local community approval and zoning, always important, especially when you're talking about events. Um, for example, a lot of uh, folks know that in wine country, not everyone can do weddings at every winery. Um, not everyone can do every kind of activity if the local zoning doesn't permit it. Um, but wineries can offer free or paid wine tastings on their winery premises, right? So you go to a tasting room, you can uh, taste wine. There used to be a lot of free wine tasting that has gone out the window, but um, there uh, you can also uh, charge for those tastings. Um, you can sell tickets to uh, larger events on your premises involving wine, food, uh, wine, beer, food, and entertainment on the premises. Um, you can also uh, sell wine and beer from any source if you've got a restaurant uh, on that winery premises. Um, you can host private events on site or off site. Um, those off site events are a little complicated, require licensing from the ABC. Um, you can offer limited wine tastings and education to consumers at on premises restaurants, uh, bars, uh, other retail locations that have that on premises license. Uh, winemaker dinners, you can donate wine to charities um, who can get a, a daily on sale general license, and that's what most of the larger events do. Um, so a lot of privileges that you can do there. Cannabis event, event options are far more limited. Um, so the way they've set up the system is not the same. It's not the same where you've got a cultivator or manufacturer that has all these privileges to be able to uh, do this experiential marketing that people um, really have taken advantage of in the wine industry to be able to get um, you know, a lot of followers. Um, there are these cannabis event licenses. Um, you can be a licensee. Um, you have to go through the whole background check process, uh, standard operating procedures, all of the you know, pretty difficult and onerous uh, requirements in order to get that license. And then for each event, so there's a $1,000 uh, fee for that uh, event license, um, and then it's either $5,000 annual license fee if you are doing between one and two, 10 events. Um, more than 10 events, it's a $10,000 fee. Um, and then you have to actually get $1,000 uh, event licenses for every single event. Now, a big part of these events that they've set up was really to kind of put in place the existing system, right? We already had the Emerald Cup cannabis cups, all of these kind of larger events, um, some of which take place very near to here um, in the Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. Um, and so it was really set up to kind of grandfather the existing system um, that existed. 
But again, with those licenses, that event licensee you know, has to pay all of that to get those licenses. They don't actually get to sell the cannabis. They have to get licensed retailers and micro businesses to be able to sell the cannabis on site. And again, you don't have alcohol at those events. You can't have a lot of the things that we're used to seeing. Now, um, licensed cultivators and manufacturers don't have the ability to sell from their premises. There are some um, limited localities that have on-premises consumption lounges. Um, but again, there, there's no sales. It's, it's a very different experience. I don't know if folks have been to any of those. It is not the kind of high-end experience that you want to be able to provide to people that you're trying to become brand advocates. Um, and there's some interesting bills in legislature right now. Um, uh, the one that was mentioned earlier, AB 2020, is the one that the industry is really promoting most. Um, that would, I missed the most important detail on the slide, but that would basically open it up so it didn't have to be just at fairgrounds locations. Um, but it imposes significant record keeping requirements. You have to do 60 days notice of everyone who's going to be participating. Anybody that's ever put on an event knows that like, being able to know everyone who's participating 60 days ahead of time is really challenging. Um, and uh, there's a very interesting one that permits um, licensees to host government officials uh, local government officials to be able to provide them education about the products, but not consumers. Um, there's another one, um, AB 2641, and um, maybe we can uh, bug Hezekiah later to see where the industry stands on this one. Um, that one would permit existing commercial cannabis licensees to apply for these licenses. Um, again, right now, if you're an event producer, you can't have any other licenses. Like, this is your only business. Um, so this would open it up a little bit more and maybe allow our manufacturers um, and cultivators to actually be able to participate in this. Um, in other words, this is time to make law and maybe try to expedite this 80-year history that it took the wine industry to actually make this happen. Um, and I think it's really important for folks that want to see more of these events um, to really demand them, to support the people that are putting their necks out there to try and make these a uh, reality, um, and really pay attention to what's happening in the legislature. All right, I'll stop, but just wanted to kind of lay a uh, groundwork there. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Devika and Jamie, I'm going to let you two sort of feed off of each other for this next question. So, um, Devika, if you could kind of just give us a top line of what event marketing means to you and kind of how you've used it to build your brand. And, Jamie, I would love if you could follow that up with a little bit about what the ROI is for a company when they're participating in event marketing. So, how do they measure the results? Thank you. Uh, so event marketing, Rebecca, I think said the magic word, experiential marketing is what a lot of people are calling it these days. And it's really creating an experience around the brand. So when you, when you can create fun and memorable experiences for your consumer, you're really co connecting them to your brand message and making them more loyal customers. And so that's a big part, especially now with the rise of social media. People want to see what is the feel of the brand, what's the lifestyle around the, around the brand. And um, the best way to do that is creating these fun experiences or events around what your brand message is. Yeah, and I think the return on your investment, there's really five things that you can think of. So number one, you're getting access to consumers. So at a cannabis event, the attendees are very curious, they're open-minded, and they're really there to discover new products. So as a brand, you really have a chance to tell your story firsthand to people that are really demanding information. Number two is you're getting access to influencers, as Dev mentioned. And as a new business, getting access and building relationships with these influencers is one of the best things you can do to really help spread the word about your brand. And at the events that I host, there's always a group of influencers that come. And they not only post about the events, but they've also made really great relationships with the brand partners um, who do join in. And I think this is extremely valuable in both wine and cannabis. And just remember, good word of mouth equals more sales. And I think influencer marketing is a powerful tool that you can take advantage of. Um, number three is FaceTime with press. So after working in wine public relations um, for many years, I know that getting a great write-up can really put your brand on the map. 
And um, there's a few things you have to remember, though. So media attend events to report. So they're not, in, they're not promoters like the influencers. And you can't dictate or control what they write. So even if you pitch them a, like a certain story angle, they may decide to write something completely different, just a better fit for their readers. Um, number four is you're building brand loyalty by participating in these events. And if you build that genuine relationship and you can really tell your story, you might have a brand supporter, brand advocate for life. And number five, by participating in an event, you're joining a community. Um, so for Thursday Infused, um, the event series that I host for the Herb Sum, my goal is really to create this authentic space for brands to connect with the consumer, um, as well as with other fellow industry leaders. And by bringing people together, this is what really helps build that special and intimate community. And at the end of, the, at the end of an event, if your goal was really to increase brand awareness, <laughs> Well, you've done this because you've accessed the consumer, the influencer, and press. So you should consider this to be a very successful event. And all of those things will expand your reach. Great. Um, I'm going to jump ahead just because I think there's something that we should address after Rebecca's um, sort of going through the positioning of where cannabis events stand now and the legalities around them to talk more about how you guys run your businesses in a legal way that's innovative and creative. So um, you've all found that way. You've all found that way to legally run a creative, legal, innovative type of event. So um, Jamie, if you want to share a little bit about your aroma pairings, and right. then you guys can talk about your wellness events. Yeah, so as the current state of the industry stands, wine and cannabis cannot be consumed together at an event. Um, hopefully this will change. <laughs> but this is why a lot of the events right now really focus on education. So I think this is very beneficial for both wine and cannabis companies. So you can have the two together for non-consumption educational purposes. So for example, as many of you know, I love to pair cannabis and wine. Um, but by doing this on an event, I really like to demonstrate um, a sensory aroma pairing and really talking about the similarities and aromas, um, but also talking about like terpenes and terroir and growing practices. So by thinking outside of the box and really using creative ways to get both products together, this is what works. Um, and this is a great intro to cannabis for new consumers when you do compare it to wine. And I think generally focusing on education mm -hmm. for an event is like a pretty, it, it's a decent safe harbor. Um, if you are, you know, really focusing on education, I mean, I saw like Outside Lands is doing like a weed lands, I think, maybe it's grasslands. called that. Grasslands, yeah. grasslands. <laughs> Um, and at Grasslands, um, as far as I understand, there's no actual cannabis, but it's really focusing a lot on education, you know, kind of similar to what Garden Society is doing out here today. Yeah. Davika, do you, do you want yeah, to Yeah, so just to build on the education component, um, that's our main thing for every event that we do. And whether we're educating on safe ways to consume or we're educating on different cannabinoids and different components of cannabis that don't have psychoactive effects, or um, there's different ways to educate on how to include cannabis into your wellness routine. And so we do um, a lot of wellness events as well, health education, women's health education, as well as some fun pop-up dinners and wine pairings, because we all come from the wine industry. Yep. Um, so how do you see event marketing fostering collaboration and innovation within the cannabis industry as opposed to perhaps the wine industry or other just CRP industries in general? Yeah, so it's, cannabis industry is still a new industry. We're all figuring it out as we go along. You know, having a cannabis brand, the laws are constantly changing. Feels like every week. So um, we really like to collaborate with other brands because we feel we're stronger together. And when we can get like-minded brands together, we can create new and unique experiences for the consumer. And so um, just really collaborating and building it together. Jamie, can you talk a little bit about uh, 
more about sort of like the influencer marketing and how you've incorporated that and perhaps yeah. anything that you've gleaned from your days in the wine industry? Yeah, absolutely. So I recently read a study um, from a digital marketing agency called ODM Group. Um, so they've reported that 74% of consumers are now relying on social media networks to make purchasing decisions. And so that's a pretty large number, 74%. And why is this? This is because traditional advertising is becoming um, ineffective and unauthentic. And content really shared by an influencer doesn't seem as like spammy or pushy. Um, and to their followers, it's really like getting a recommendation from a friend. Um, so as I mentioned before, as a business selling a product, building that relationship with an influencer can be very powerful for your business because they're your advocate. And they're also putting your brand in front of active, engaged audience. And just from a personal side um, about my own business for the Herb Psalm, when I was launching my event series called Thursday Infused, my very first event, I had a really tough time selling tickets because no one knew what it was. Um, so I made sure to invite a handful of influencers that came to help spread the word. And after that first event, many of those influencers have become my close friends. And we're always looking for ways to collaborate with each other. And we've actually started a collective of content creators um, and cannabis influencers where brands can actually hire a group to do product activations, launches, um, advertising, et cetera. And there's 10 influencers that are involved with this group, including myself, so Sonoma, um, some other big players, Sue Weed and Elise Nick Roberts. Um, so we've all joined together. And I think this collaborative approach to influencer marketing is kind of like the next step um, of what the future could look like. So I really think it's exciting for companies who are working or, or who are interested in working um, on a larger scale. And Allison, can you kind of follow that with any things that you've seen in terms of wine and cannabis brands working together to build that brand awareness? Yeah, I think that the wine industry has sort of been sitting back a little bit and observing what's happening. Um, I think that there's a curiosity out there that, um, you know, we have approached people, um, since we do non-consumption events, um, to pour wines to be paired. And um, I feel like people, they're opening up to it a little bit, and there is that curiosity there. So, um, yeah, we've had some amazing experiences with um, other wine brands, other cannabis brands that we've um, partnered with. And um, just in like our dinner that we're doing tonight with terpenes and terroir at the shed, um, that will be a non-consumption event, but we'll you know pair wine and cannabis together and really kind of explore that. And uh, we have some amazing wine brands that are um, going to be there supporting us. So I think it's it's an opening. That's nice great. To see, yeah. That. Um so we have a question from the audience. What is the ideal scenario for wine and weed events with regard to the participating winery being protected? And we also had a question on our list about kind of where the legal line around wine and cannabis brands at the same event um, is crossed. Kind of where, where is it legal, where is it not? Can you have a cannabis branded event at a winery property? Does it need to be private? So if you want to kind of dive into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so the... The ABC has released some guidance on kind of alcohol and cannabis, um, and uh, I encourage folks to, to check that out. I did a, a blog post on that a while ago on our website, but um, abc.ca.gov. Um, and it sort of, it, you know, explains where, where the, the two can work together or not. Um, and really what you're talking about is licensed premises. So if you're a winery and you have a, a O2 license premises, you have your um, TTB federal basic permit. Um, I would not recommend doing cannabis events um, on that premises, right? You have a federal license, um, not a good place to do it. Um, but if you have um, an unlicensed event area or you have vineyards, you have you know, areas of your property that do not have that license, Maybe it's something you're interested in trying out. Um, all of this, you know, important to remember, the, the other panel talked a little bit about federal law. Federal law, not, not good. There's no safe harbor under federal law to, to do this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in collaborating, um, to a certain extent, you have to have a, a tolerance for risk. Um, and so it's kind of figuring out where you fall on that scale 
Um, the other thing to think about is there's really low enforcement of this stuff right now. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of events going on, and uh, you know, so far we haven't heard of people um, you know, having those events shut down. Um, the ABC kind of goes on different uh, you know, tears of things that they're focused on. I think the um, cannabis regulators are really focused on getting rid of the black market right now, right? Like your like, small event um, featuring 20 people, probably not an enforcement priority. Um, but you know, it's something you have to go into eyes wide open and recognize like, is this something I'm comfortable with, yes or no? Do I have something to lose, yes or no? Um, but you know, I think it does take people who are willing to experiment and explore in this space, and you know, there's really an opportunity to uh, capture the consumers that clearly have an interest in this stuff. I think there's an interesting comment on here. It's a bit of a question, but can influencers help with brand adjacent marketing across wine and cannabis as they have no legal ramifications for posting with both products? Um, Juxtapose. So that kind of goes into what you were talking about with influencers and using social media. Yeah. Um, so do you, I, it's more to me that's a bit of a statement, but I think it's quite relevant. Do you have anything to feed off of there? Well, I know in my own social media network, I post a lot about wine and cannabis um, together, actually. And I think I've created kind of like this niche market of people who are interested in that. And I think there's other brands like So Sonoma who's also kind of carved out that sector as well of people who really want to incorporate cannabis into a gourmet setting, and that does include wine. Um, yeah, going back to the legal side of it, um, how some wineries may participate um, in these kind of events but not have it on their ABC license facility mm -hmm. is um, we can purchase wine from them, they could come to the event on an off-site location and still talk about their brand and their wines and reach that consumer in different ways instead of having it at their winery location or tasting room. Um, just because I'm bad cop, um, <laughs> on, the, on the influencer marketing stuff, um, I would say certainly influencers can do what they want, right? They don't have licenses. Um, if you share that content, then you're adopting it as your own. So um, recognize that, that you know, uh, wine advertising is regulated, um, cannabis advertising is regulated. Uh, so when you're, again, are, is this a priority for Lori Ajax to go out and like, check your social media feed and see if you're posting about this stuff? I don't think so. <laughs> but you know, uh, you, everybody has to decide where they want to play. Um, and what they're comfortable with. You know, I have clients all the time, I'll you know, do a whole webinar on social media advertising, and they're like, great, yeah, thank you. And then they go and do whatever they want, right? Like, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just something everyone has to kind of um, decide where they want to play. From, um... Uh-oh. Hello. Oh, yeah. we go. <laughs> From kind of since we're talking about like legalities around wine and cannabis together, I think it also draws the question of consumer safety. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that alcohol and cannabis are multipliers of each other. So I think it's important to talk a bit about kind of how you guys are providing that safe experience for consumers, even though it's non-consumption, it's st still promoting cannabis and wine in the same place. Um, so I think it would be great to just talk a little bit about consumer safety. Yeah, so I think we touched on a little bit with the educational component, right. safe ways to consume, even if that's in your own home. Um, a big thing with our events is we like to offer, if there's any kind of consumption, whether that's wine consumption or cannabis consumption, uh, to offer transportation, so a shuttle option, so you can kind of help with the driving side of it. And then Rebecca, I know there's um, consumer safety guidelines from Wine Institute, so do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, and one thing before I forget it, um, which is important for everyone in this room, is um, Prop 65. Um, we're actually going to put a blog post, I think on Friday, on our website, beveragelaw.com, that goes into the Prop 65 stuff. It is scary. Um, Prop 65 is the uh, proposition that requires uh, posting about uh, cancer-causing ingredients. Um, and this is something that uh, the laws are changing in this space. Um, starting August 30th, there is a new 
um, standard safe harbor. So this is just kind of a, you know, everyone needs to be thinking about Prop 65. It's so stupid um, because, I don't know about you, but I see those signs and I'm like, yeah, every, literally everything has cancer in it. Um, we're all screwed. But um, the Prop 65 stuff is really a huge place for uh, plaintiff's lawyers to come and sue you. And um, it, it is, it is a, those, those cases are scary. I'm scared. I wake up sometimes. I don't even have a business. And I wake up. I'm like, oh, do I need a Prop 65 warning? And like, for the law firm? Like, <laughs> scary. So um, remember that um, and look up that. Um, and then, yeah, as far as like the um, marketing stuff, uh, the Wine Institute has uh, a really good set of guidelines on um, marketing practices and how to you know, market uh, products being safely consumed with food, um, making sure that you're not promoting underage drinking, making sure that you're not encouraging, you know, drinking and driving, um, all of these things that, um, you know, I think the wine industry has done really well. Um, and I think we're seeing more of that in cannabis too. You know, cannabis, I feel like it's, it's all about going slow. Right, making sure that uh, you, if you're new to it, or even if you're not, I mean, I feel like the, if you're consuming products that you're not used to, that are not your own, um, making sure that you go very slow, wait a little bit, see how the effect is, um, all of that I think is really important when you're doing events, and it sounds like these ladies do uh, uh, place a great deal of emphasis on that. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that Alcohol enhances the effects of THC, so if you are ever combining the two, it is easy to go overboard. So that's why yeah. low and slow education is a big component. And everything yep. in moderation. Yep. Sure. Um, so this is an interesting question as this whole event is around bringing the cannabis and wine communities closer together. So what have you guys heard while you're out doing your events from, from the wine industry? Have you had any pushback? Have you, you know, what are you hearing? What are you seeing as you're out doing this day to day? I think from my experience, the wine industry is very curious. So they're curious about who's attending these events. They're curious, like, how can I get involved? And I think that, you know, as we're having these conversations, um, I think there's a lot of um, value in partnering with a wine brand and a cannabis brand, legally, of course. Um, but yeah, curiosity is definitely what I'm seeing from my side. Yeah, I think that, you know, we come from, you know, this hospitality space and from the wine industry and, you know, we're taking everything that we know from that and applying it to the cannabis space. And I think that wineries, like I was saying before, they're very open to seeing how, you know, well, who is this uh, consumer and how can we market to them and how can we pair up with um, uh, other cannabis brands and who, who is legit and, you know, there's a lot of questions that are sort of open-ended out there. Um, but uh, just from coming from that, you know, side of things of food, wine, now cannabis being, you know, this commodity that we have in our, um, in our county, I think that, um, yeah, people are, the, the wineries are, I haven't seen any pushback myself. I've come from that industry, and I think it's a perfect pairing. So, yeah, yeah and I, I've seen a mix. I, I have seen clients that are like, uh, you know, can I can I say no to this? Um, and I'm like, one, you can always say no. Everyone, it's good practice in life. Um, and two, like, yeah, like there's a very easy legal basis to be like, I, you know, don't feel comfortable with this. This isn't my bag. This isn't my, you know, consumer group. Uh, not how I want to uh, brand my product. Um, and, uh, you know, on the other hand, I think there's uh, a lot more interest and a lot more involvement from the wine industry than people necessarily know about. Um, I think there's a lot of products that um, will be coming online soon um, that feature kind of uh, collaborations. So uh, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that. Uh, I think there's a good question that came up on the um, board here. So talking about navigating private events on private properties. So we've, we've been approached as a brand to sponsor, quote, private events that are invitation only. And there have been aspects of that where like, well, no, there's still consumption. So how, you Bad know, cap. Mm. yeah, mm -hmm. so how do you, uh, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, the, the deal with private events is if you're making money from it, then it's not a private event. 
So if you're selling tickets, if you're asking for a donation, um, you know, people have gotten creative, and I think that's great. Um, I, I love creativity. Um, pushes me to provide better advice. Um, but I think you know, when the donation thing, for example, OK, that works if you allow me to sign up for free. But if it says donation, and then I'm going to an Eventbrite website, and then I have to put my credit card in, then like, ah, eh, maybe not suggest a donation, right? So maybe you think about collecting the donations at the door. Maybe that's a way that, you know, and you RSVP, and then you deal with it um, there. Um, everything, I think, when you're structuring these kinds of things, and re when you're pushing the boundaries, and, you know, trying to create this new industry as it's developing in front of you, um, is thinking of, okay, what can I do from a record keeping perspective to be able to make it easier for my lawyers to make that defense case? Um, so, you know, <laughs> that like, yeah, look at this. This is a private event. Like, we got a charity involved and everything went to that charity. Now, for folks doing businesses, that's hard, right? Um, but maybe you have um, an educational piece that is like very clearly, you know, a separate event. And like, maybe people are bringing their own. Maybe you are asking people to go to a dispensary beforehand and buy the product themselves, and then you're just showing up to um, provide education. Um, so I think there's kind of a lot of different things that you can do in that private setting. And again, that private setting really tells you more about the likelihood of enforcement, right? Um, how high is the risk if it's in someone's home who you've met and you know, and they're inviting their friends and, you know, it's not something that your uh, enforcement agencies can, can buy tickets to, right? That's a totally different kind of thing, so. Yeah, and I was gonna add to that too. If it's your friends having a dinner party and they wanna have a cannabis event in their private home, I think the number is, you know, if it's under 50 people, it's considered a, a private event. If there's no sales, there's no, it's not for profit. And how does that, I, there was a question on here about tourism. How does that apply to a tour? So if you're on a bus, yeah. it's almost like a mini event. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the, we're going to see a lot more tours if, uh, you know, the localities allow them. Because um, I think that is a good way, right? You're very clearly providing a service, transportation. Um, you're not selling products. You're you know, going to licensed locations where consumers can buy products. Um, and that's a totally separate transaction. Um, I think another one, just because CBD is such a buzz term right now, um, <laughs> have you seen any uh, food and tasting events with hemp or CBD infused wines? I don't know if that's well, even a question. That we I mean. are hopefully starting something because we see a need for that in, in the event space. Um, so, you know, obviously it cannot have alcohol in it. So uh, we will be hopefully launching this fall a, um, it'll be infused with THC, um, non-alcoholic wine. Okay. So. so yeah, and I think there, the hemp stuff is a little bit dicier. Um, again, bad cop. Um, the California Department of Public Health released guidance at the beginning of July um, around uh, products involving hemp uh, and food, um, and basically has said that those products are not lawful in the state of California. So um, something to think about with CBD um, it may actually be easier to do CBD products that are derived from cannabis um, and selling them within the uh, cannabis licensed retail system. So um, that, that's another fun, not fun, uh, <laughs> part of, of the law. And you know, again, I think I, I feel for the regulators, they're really trying to crack down on the black market. They're trying to make this legal experiment work. Um, and I think there's a lot of folks that are doing hemp-based CBD products as a way to avoid getting into that license system. So um, I think you know, we all need a dose of uh, patience and also you know, keep speaking up about the products that we want to see. I want to give time to kind of talk about the future of cannabis events. So Jamie, I know that you're active in the San Francisco event community. Yeah. Um, so I would love for you to share kind of what you're seeing on the horizon. Yeah, well, I think there's a really exciting group that is just forming. Um, it's called Crop to Kitchen. 
So this organization um, is really working together to build a movement to make cannabis cuisine um, a reality in California and to really position um, the Bay Area as the capital for uh, cannabis cuisine. So we're calling on people who are in the restaurant business, chefs, um, people who are involved with wine, um, anyone who's curious about adding cannabis as an actual ingredient. Um, and hopefully, maybe one day we will see cannabis restaurants with a wine list. I think that would be amazing. Um, and the next meeting is on September 10th. And this meeting is really focused on cannabis and beverages. And I'll be speaking as well as Somatic, who does a beautiful infused coffee. And Humboldt Distil Distillery will also be a presenter. Um, so if you do want more information, I have a card at our booth. Um, so please stop by, and I'd be happy to give you more information. There's a question about here about tax and record keeping. Um, because there's no consumption for flour at the events that you guys do, I don't know that anyone on this panel will be able to relevantly um, respond to that question, but I don't, do you have a? Uh, tax is a whole other can of worms. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense for this panel, but I'm happy to chat with whoever asked that question um, offline and you know, fumble my way through tax stuff. Perfect. <laughs> um, I think, let's see. Oh, have you guys, that's actually an interesting question looking at other states. Have you guys done, like when you were building your brands and doing this research, did you guys mm -hmm. investigate kind of what Colorado's doing, what Washington, Oregon, kind of what those guys are doing? Yeah, what I think was fun with some things in Colorado is they have but in breakfast that you can go stay at and experience that kind of experience. And then also the weed weddings that are mm -hmm. becoming really popular in California too. So not only will you have your bar at your wedding, but you'll also have a cannabis bar. And we're kind of seeing that pop up a little bit in California now too. And also just adding on, Las Vegas is now a hub for cannabis like experiences. So I've seen a lot of people actually move from Colorado to Las Vegas to start these experiences, um, like bud tending and um, yeah, um, Wedding. weed weddings and so on. So Vegas is definitely a big hub for events right now. And Colorado does have kind of the most advanced um, laws in the space because they were first. Um, and they did um, pass a on-premises consumption license. Um, but those are, uh, you can't buy it there. It's kind of like a coffee house uh, experiment um, or experience. So uh, you, it's basically a safe space for you to be able to consume um, in that environment. So it's, again, I think not the winery tasting room experience that we would all like to see um, that will hopefully come soon. And I suspect that California will have it first. I think we've covered most of the questions that have been coming in in addition to sort of what we were talking, what, what we had hoped to address. Do you guys have any um, additional points that you wanted to get across? I know it's, we're inching up to lunchtime. So. I just wanted to say uh, we're having our dinner after this symposium at the Healdsburg Shed, Terpenes and Terroir, and we're excited to see whoever's coming. And if you can't make this one, we hope to see you at the next event. And uh, you can find us on our website, tsosonoma.com or find us on Instagram at tsosonoma. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, to the four of you. This has been very interesting and thanks to everyone who sat. Uh, there will be lunch outside uh, immediately at following. Yeah, and we're sponsoring it. So. <laughs> Great job, Carly. Thanks, everyone. That was fantastic. So. Yeah, folks, head on out. Um, I think lunch is all set up outside, and there's a couple different buffet lines, so if there's a big line of yours, look for another table, and then, um, and then one o'clock, get right back to it, okay? So we'll see you guys in an hour.